So, what do you say? To Ready? The fishing. Yeah. Historia Anomalium is so filled with observations about the creatures that live in and around the lagoon that they cannot all be Aristotle's own. He must have interrogated people who knew about animals. As Darwin wrote to pigeon fanciers, so Aristotle spoke to fishermen. So roughly, where are we going? We're going out here to the right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That direction. So in the middle, about in the middle. About, about halfway there. down the lagoon. Yeah. The lagoon cuts the island of Lesvos nearly in two. It is one of the most productive stretches of water in the eastern Aegean. And it contains an animal to which Aristotle was particularly devoted, the cuttlefish. The first few traps are empty, but there are cuttlefish down there. These are the eggs? Yeah. The nest is covered in them. Exactly. That's fantastic. God, there must be thousands and thousands of cuttlefish down there. You can see the embryo. Look. Yeah. You can see the embryo. I didn't expect that. I thought that they stayed black all, all along throughout their development. No, some of, the them, sense... some of them, they haven't been sprayed. Not all of them. Very few. You mean they haven't been fertilized? Yeah. No, no, they are, but they are usually when they finish, they spray it with ink to protect. Oh, I see. I see. The ink is the last thing they do. But the pale ones, you can see right inside them. And you can see the little baby's cuttlefish. Yeah, they're moving. And they're moving, you're absolutely right. And you can see its eyes. You can see it exactly as Aristotle describes it. My God, they're gorgeous. They're amazing. In a week or two, they all will be gone. And then we see movement. Cuttlefish, dozens of them. These weird, wonderful animals infest the lagoon, and Aristotle has a lot to say about them. He describes how they change color, and how they eject ink when they're afraid, how they breed, how they hunt with these amazing long tentacles, and the fact that they only live for about a year. One of Aristotle's masterpieces is the dissection of the cuttlefish. Aristotle describes the anatomy of a cuttlefish in detail. He describes its gills over here. He describes its reproductive organs. This is, this is a female. These are the glands with which it produces the shell. He knows that cuttlefish have a very unusual anatomy insofar that the, the guts are bent around such that, in effect, it defecates on its head. Its rectum is located very close to its brain and its eyes underneath the, the mantle cavity, unlike most creatures whose rectums are at the opposite ends of their bodies from their mouths. The mouth, the beak, which is hard, which is, with which it bites, over there. He looks inside of the cuttlefish and he sees that the biggest organ is a big orange thing, which he calls the mitis, and it's right in the middle of the body. He thinks that this is the heart, or at least the equivalent of a cuttlefish heart. It isn't. It's the liver. But because it's centrally located, and our hearts are centrally located, he in effect argues that they are the same thing. It's an easy mistake to make. And it must be said that everything else he does is just incredibly impressive. Aristotle's description of the anatomy of the cuttlefish 
was not bettered until the 17th century, when a Dutchman, Jan Swammerdam, found the cuttlefish's hearts, all three of them. You might expect that a book like this would be ordered by species, that there'd be a chapter on insects and another chapter on cuttlefish and lizards and so on and so forth, but it isn't. In fact, it's ordered by system. There are sections on digestion and reproduction and life cycles. Really, it's ordered like any modern invertebrate zoology textbook. And it's that that tells us that Aristotle isn't simply accumulating natural history knowledge. He's doing something much more systematic. He's doing science. And therein lies a paradox. The way in which Aristotle structured this book is so familiar to us, so very much a part of the way we think about the natural world and how we do biology, that it's almost impossible for us to understand just how original he was. And yet, when he came down to this lagoon, saw the creatures in it, cut them up, and wrote down what he saw, he was the very first person to have ever done so. What he does next is revolutionary. Having sorted his data, having arranged his facts, he begins to explain. He pits theory against observation. He invents a new way of understanding the world. He applies this method to one of biology's deepest problems. How life originates in the egg and in the womb. He wants to know how the words are his living things come to be. If you really want to understand development, you have to do what Aristotle did. You have to go to a farmyard and get yourself some fertilized chicken eggs. One of the charms of this is that you just don't know what you're actually going to see until you open the egg. Sometimes, when you do, you see exactly what Aristotle saw. Aristotle would have looked inside the egg with the naked eye. But we can do a bit better with this handy little microscope which attaches to my computer. It's a little bit tricky, but if you focus it just right, you can see what I'm seeing. It's an embryo, not more than a few days old, lying there, minute, on its bed of albumin and yolk, with the, the blood vessels, the vitaline arteries and veins ramifying into its surroundings. You can see its head, you can see its eye, and above all, you can see its little heart just beating there. Even Aristotle's detractors, and he does have them, have to give him credit for this. He's the first person to open an egg and describe the embryo of a chick. He's the first person to describe the origin of a living thing. Aristotle describes the growth of an apparently inanimate egg into a living, breathing, copulating creature. Had he done just this, he would be worthy of our admiration. But I think he did much more. I think he attempted to, and largely succeeded in, penetrating to the very deepest secrets of life. 
Why do chicks hatch from chicken eggs? Why not tortoises, fish or snakes? It sounds like a trivial question, but it isn't. It's a question about why progeny look like their parents. It's a question about inheritance. Aristotle argued that the properties of matter, the elemental building blocks of the world, cannot explain how an embryo constructs itself. Something else is needed, something that it gets from its parents, something that shapes it. And he called that thing ADOS. Which is what, exactly? Well, this is where Aristotle gets hard. This is where we hit his metaphysics. We need a classical philosopher. This is what one looks like. Richard King and I have been talking Aristotle for years. Aristotle takes a comparison between uh, the material constituents of things, the elements as he calls them, and the form, or ADOS, and he says the elements are like letters, A and B, and you can combine them in various ways. So you can either have the syllable AB or the syllable BA, ab or ba, and the arrangement, well, that's the form, and the form is different in each case. So the form is different from the material constituents. So what he seems to be saying is that it's not the stuff of which it's made that matters, it's the way in which that stuff is ordered. Exactly, exactly. It's the order of the material constituents just as the order of the letters makes the two different syllables. So what ADOS really is, is something like information. That's right. Information or a kind of activity. And, and, and the really remarkable thing is he's using a metaphor for information, the order of the letters that is almost exactly like the metaphor that we use when we speak about the genetic code, about DNA, after all. It's not the material constituents of DNA that matter, rather it's the order of the elements of which DNA is made up, the molecules, the nucleotides. That's the information. That's right. One of Aristotle's methods for studying living things was simplicity itself. He cut them open while still alive. Aristotle has an enthusiasm for vivisection that today seems excessive. He describes how if you cut an insect such as this in half, it lives for a surprisingly long time. Well, lots of modern biologists vivisect insects, but few vivisect chameleons. Aristotle did. After being cut open, he observes, that the chameleon continues to breathe for a considerable time. And tortoises. They, he says, continue to wiggle their legs even after their hearts have been removed. I don't know how long a tortoise would survive without its heart, and I am not, I think, inclined to find out. And yet Aristotle's belief that some creatures can survive for a surprisingly long time and eviscerated strikes to one of the deepest parts of his research program. For when Aristotle cut out the heart of a tortoise, he was in search of nothing less than its soul.